Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and I'm awfully glad that I'm going to be able to continue a series I started a while back because I really enjoyed it, and it was called New Friend, Same Seven Questions. And I always think it's good to flex our apologetics and evangelism muscle. We get asked questions all the time, and we need to be equipped and ready to answer it. And sometimes when you hear the questions over and over and they're answered by different people, you can sort of build your own uh, case for how you're going to approach people when you talk to them about some of the, the big questions out there. Questions like, is man separated from God? We're, that's one of the, the seven questions. And my guest today is a familiar voice here on the show, Jeff Redorn. He's, he said that he would love to do the, the same seven questions series. So here he is, Jeff. Welcome. Hi, Bill. Well, I'm so glad that you agreed to this, and I, I think I've called it new friend, same seven questions. But yeah, you're, don't don't you, say old friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a friend I've had for a while. I'll there just put go. it that way, but I'm <laughs> awfully glad you can do this, because I hope there's a lot of people that had conversations over the weekend with loved ones or people about their faith. Yeah, and these questions are going to cover some of the key fundamentals of that faith. I liked in your introduction because it reminds me of something that I say to my classes often, is that that is that we should know what we believe and why we believe it from Scripture. And yeah. that's what these questions are all about. I think that's significant. I've, I've said that anyone who has a, a view, of a religious view, at least understand what it is you believe and be able to express it. Even if I disagree with you, it's good practice to say, I know what I'm believing, and here it is. Exactly. And, and, you know, in the, in Acts, in chapter 17, uh, the Bereans are commended. It says then the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched their scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So if they were uh, commended for that, we as believers, anytime we hear a teaching, anytime we hear someone on the radio or in our in a pulpit, we should search the scriptures ourselves to understand why we believe and what we believe from scripture. And one of the dots I connected, I think this year, Jeff, when it comes to the Bereans is the Bereans didn't have little personal Bibles at home. They didn't go home and look in their personal Bible. They gathered in community and discussed. They did. You know, the availability of the Word of God today for the for this century's Christian is just amazing. Uh, not only do we have the printed Word today, which they wouldn't have had in the first century, but we have the Bible on our computers, on our phones. We can search the Greek and the Hebrew at any time. One of my favorite apps is called Blue Letter Bible. It's both on the web uh, and an app. And you can Uh, compare versions of Scripture. You can look at any number of different versions of the Bible to see how those translators translated the Hebrew and the Greek, and you can go back into the Hebrew and the Greek and look at the definition of those words yourself. So we have amazing tools today to study Scripture. We would be the envy of first century Christians. We have the entire revealed Word of God. We do. In fact, uh, Hebrews talks about the those uh, men of faith of old in the faith chapter, it says at one point, uh, I can't remember the exact verse, it says that they longed to look into what we now possess in Christ Jesus. Wow. Remember, nobody in the Old Testament had the indwelling Holy Spirit like we do today. No one in the Old Testament was ever born again. We have this this great union with God that they longed to look into. Mm-hmm. And we not only do we have the Word in so many different practical ways that we can search, but we also have the Holy Spirit, which Scripture says will lead us and guide us into truth. And Jesus had just the Old Testament. He did. That's when when he says the Scripture says, anytime it says in the New Testament, the Scriptures say uh, they're referring to the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Are you ready to dive into the seven questions, Jeff? I am. Good. I, I assume that you've done some prep uh, work as well. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Question number one is something I've already mentioned. Is man 
separated from God. Now, before you answer, Mm -hmm. I'm going to just say, I have people say all the time, well, how can I be separated from God? I'm a child of God. Yeah, that line that is repeated often is one of the great lies of the world, actually, that we're all God's children. Uh, Scripture makes it very clear that in our natural state, we are separated from God. So the simple answer to the question is, yes, man in their natural state is separated from God. We don't become a child of God until we believe in Christ and are saved. Then God gives us the right to be called his children. But this is really a, a Genesis chapter one issue. We know that God made man and woman and he made them good. Everything he made was good. In fact, the last day he said everything he made was very good. And man was uh, in union with God, not only physically, right? God was there. He, it says that he walked in the garden. He obviously spoke to Adam, uh, probably a theophany, by the way, a, a Christophany, an appearance of God in the Old Testament in bodily human form is called a Christophany. And that's probably the person of Christ that we, that who's God incarnate in the flesh, if you will, pre his incarnation. But God was with them. But more importantly, God was with Adam and Eve spiritually. They were one. They were united. So we get to chapter 3 of Genesis, and God says, if you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. So this question, are we separated from God, goes right back to Genesis 3, because they did eat from that tree, and they did die that day. But they did not die physically, because obviously Adam and Eve walked out of the garden. It says in Scripture that Adam lived to be 930 years old, so he didn't die physically. So how did he die that day? He died spiritually. Man is body, soul, and spirit. And that understanding of man's three parts, by the way, we're made in the image of God. God's a three-part being. We are also a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. It's his spirit that died that day. Adam died spiritually that day. What that means is God's spirit separated from Adam, bringing spiritual death to Adam. And so God kicks them out of the garden, like I mentioned. I think it's primarily because they wouldn't therefore have access to the tree of life and live forever in their fallen state because God has had a plan. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 3, the first prophecy for God's remedy, God's solution to this problem of man now being separated from him, man now being sinful, comes in a prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 where it says, he will strike your heel, but you will crush his head. That's a prophecy spoken to the serpent, and most theologians agree it's actually spoken to Satan that says, yeah, you'll bruise his heel, Mm -hmm. Christ's heel, but he, meaning Christ, will crush your head. He is now a defeated foe. God have, has a plan to send his son to, to, to uh, fix the issue of man's sin once and for all. That's what we celebrate every Easter. He was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the New Testament declares this separation, this idea that we are dead or separated from God very clearly. Um, Ephesians 2 says that we are dead in our transgressions and sins. Ephesians 4.18 says we're separated from God. So the question really is, are we separated from God, comes straight from Scripture. Colossians 1 says we're alienated from God. John 3 says that man stands condemned already. We're called God's enemies. We're called sinners. Look, God has lots of descriptions uh, of the lost. We're, We're dead in our sins. We don't know God we're foolish, our father is the devil, we're God's enemies, we're ignorant, we're lost, we're slaves to sin, we're unbelievers. These are all the different ways that God describes those people who are lost or separated from him. And But thankfully, thankfully, God doesn't leave us there. We know from Peter that it says, God wishes none to perish but all to come to repentance so that even though that's man's problem, God has a plan. He has an answer. 
And uh, that answer will come uh, forth in, in some of the following questions. But yes, man is separated from God. That's mm. our nature. Mm-hmm. Jeff Verdorn is my guest, and I asked him to do the New Friends Same Seven Questions series. And it's, uh, we, just fig- we just finished question number one, is man separated from God? All right, Jeff, you ready for question two? Yep. All right, question two is, what is the fate of the lost? And, and what are we saved from? Well, it's, Scripture is clear that when man dies, whether they're lost or saved, that the human existence doesn't cease at physical death, that there is something that comes after that. Um, so today we know from Scripture that when the righteous die, they, they will go to heaven. Even though their body goes into the ground, they themselves, their soul and, and spirit actually, goes to heaven um, and to be with the Lord. Paul declares in 2 Corinthians, for example, that he would be, once he dies, he'll be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. He also says in Philippians that I desire to depart and be with the Lord. So we know very clearly from Scripture that when a believer dies, they will be immediately in the presence of God with Christ in heaven. Now, when the unrighteous die, when unbelievers die, they go to a place called Hades, Hades is the place that before the cross all people went to. There was a good side and there was a bad side. There was the paradise side or the bosom of Abraham, and there was the bad side called torment. And we see this picture of this place called Hades clearly, for example, in Luke 16 and Lazarus and the rich man. They both die, but they go to two different places And in between them, there's a giant chasm that there's no crossing from one side to another. We learn a lot of things about uh, what happens after die. One is that it's not soul sleep. These guys are talking. They recognize Father Abraham. The rich man says, uh, Father Abraham, send Lazarus back into my house where my brothers are so they will not come to this place. Like warn them, warn them. This is the place of torment, by the way, where many of the parables in Matthew will say that the wicked or the unrighteous will go to a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's this place. After the cross, all the righteous now, instead of going to the paradise side of Hades, now go to heaven. So we've got the righteous covered. The unrighteous still go to Hades to this day. So Hades, since the very beginning of mankind, the torment side of Hades has been collecting the unrighteous dead all the way up until their final judgment, which is yet future. It is to come. But this is not the final fate of the lost. And it's actually not the final fate of the righteous either. The final fate of the righteous is that we are going to get a new glorified body and live with Christ forever and ever in a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. But the fate of the lost is different. And I want to read in Revelation what it says about the final judgment of all of the lost. In other words, all of Hades is going to come before a a judgment that's called the great white throne judgment. And it's described in Revelation chapter 20. Let me read it. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and heaven fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, that is the lost, all the lost people from throughout history, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were open, and another book was open, which was the book of life. The dead were judged according to what was done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up its dead, and each person was judged according to what he has done. Judgment is always based on deeds, by the way. But the reason that they're at this judgment is because their name is not found in the Lamb's book of life. Mm -hmm. They are unbelievers. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, in other words, they did not believe, was thrown into the lake of fire. That is the ultimate fate of the lost. Whoa. Yeah. And you are saved from that. We are In fact, Revelation earlier in chapter 3 says, if you're an overcomer, you will not be hurt by the second death. And the, the lost will be. So the lost, when they die, they go to Hades. 
at the last day, judgment will come, this great white throne judgment. They will be brought before the throne of God. Their names will not be found in the Lamb's Book of Life, and they are thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. That, by the way, is the, the, the full culmination of John 3.16 happens on that day. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so whoever believes in him shall not perish in the lake of fire, the second death being thrown into the lake of fire, but, there's this contrast, right, but have everlasting life. So look, on that side of the equation, I'm choosing eternal life with God every single day. Mm, me as well. Thank you for there, stating that truth. Jeff Redorn is my guest. New friend, Same 7 Questions, series I have so enjoyed. And every guest answers the same seven questions. And it equips us to be better at sharing our faith, getting some hard questions answered. And these are the kind of questions that people will raise when you have conversations with them about your faith. And I want you to be better equipped and, and feel like you can confidently be in any discussion with anybody about what your faith means and what and how well you can communicate it to, to others. So we'll be back after a very short break. You, you're loved, and God at any given moment knows exactly where you are. Now, I know that it might not always feel like that, but the truth is, is that God loves you so much, he calls you his. If you would like to discover, maybe even rediscover how important you are to him, then attend the Set Apart Conference for Women on March 8th and 9th. Speakers Lisa Harper, Crystal Evans Hurst, Pam Lindell, and many more will bring you wisdom and direction to your weekend. It's like a spa retreat for your spirit. Register at setapartconference.com. This is a gift that you give yourself that you're never going to regret. Setapartconference.com. I hope you can join us. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is a familiar voice here on the show, Jeff Redorn. He's answering the same seven question series, which I've been doing for months and months and months. It's, I just love it. And Jeff, uh, we're through questions one, and now we're going to finish the rest of part two. Uh, what, are, what are we saved from, and what is the fate of the lost? That's question two. But I know there's been people that have said, you know, if, if there's a God after I die, I'll, I'll tell him that he's got some explaining to do. And you didn't tell me enough, and I'll be able to talk my way once I get there. Yeah, you know, these two fates that we're going to talk about are fixed during this life. Uh, scripture declares that it's appointed for man to die once and then face judgment. So how you answer the question of who is Jesus uh, is going to determine your eternal fate. It's that simple. You, you don't get a chance after you die. God gives us this life. He offers salvation to everybody, and if you choose him, uh, he'll save you for all of eternity. If you don't, by the way, what are we saved from that we were talking about right before the break? We, as believers, are saved from death, literally the second death, the lake of fire. You know, throughout Scripture, there are pictures of this this hell, this lake of fire. In John 15, we got the vine and the branches, and those branches that are not connected to the vine, well, they are gathered up and burned. That is a picture of the hellfire. Hebrews 10 says that all that's left, if you reject God's salvation, there's only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Wow, that's pretty clear. Second Peter 3 says that it's kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. Philippians 3 says of the lost, their destiny is destruction. Do we have a theme going here? Second, <laughs> I think we do. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says that people perish because they refuse to love the truth and thus be saved. I mean, over and over and over in Scripture, there are, there are two roads, two gates. There's the wheat and the tares, the good seed and the bad seed, the good fish, uh, the bad fish, the wise and the foolish, uh, the sheep and the goats. Uh, there's the resurrection of the righteous, and there's a resurrection 
of the wicked. Look, there's two paths. There's two eternal destinies for every mankind, for believers and for unbelievers, the lost. There is, by the way, a a, a kind of a surge once again in our country of this old lie of universalism. I think probably because of a guy named Rob Bell who wrote a book back in 2011 that's the title of it was that love wins. And in it, he proposed this idea that in the end, because of God's love, everybody will end up being saved. Well, yes, love is one of the great characteristics of our God, but his righteousness and his wrath and his judgment are just as much a part of his character as his love and his mercy and his grace. I happened to go to the Christian Universalist Association website, and I found 20 different books that are out there right now uh, espousing this old lie that one day everybody goes to heaven. And the dividing line is just so clear in Scripture, it can't be denied. Salvation is literally life versus death. I set before you, God says, Life and death choose life. Mm, so good. All right, Jeff Dorn, let's move on to question number three. What is or, or when is the point a person is saved and how does that happen? Well, the simple answer is when you believe. Uh, believe the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That is the truth claim that God came to this earth, he died for the sins of the world, he was buried, and he rose again according to the scriptures. And this gospel, if you believe it, it's the power of God unto salvation. Um, So so believe, if you believe. Now that sounds so easy, so simple. And in fact, it's so simple, even a child can understand it. Now, this word believe, I often say this, if, if you know one Greek word. Know the Greek word for believe. It's the Greek word pistuyo, and it has two uh, two core definitions. The first part of pistuyo is to believe something is true. The second part of pistuyo is then to entrust, especially for your salvation. So biblical belief, and by the way, faith is is basically the same Greek word. It's just the verb and the noun of this word. If you believe it's true and you entrust for salvation, Jesus Christ, that is biblical faith. That is believing in Christ. This simple uh, criteria is, is spoken over and over and over again in scripture. So John 3 says, whoever believes shall not perish. John 6 says, whoever believes has eternal life. John 11 says, whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. Acts 13 says, through him, everyone who believes is justified. In Romans 10, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. 1 John 5, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and becomes a child of God. That is what faith is. Believing believing Christ is who he says he was and did what scripture says he did and putting your eternal fate in his hands, entrusting him for salvation. So good. Jeff Redorn's my guest. We're answering those same seven questions. That's a series I've had for, I don't know, six, eight months. And I've sure enjoyed it. And I've heard some powerful uh, ways in which to understand and share your faith and improve your ability to do apologetics. So we'll take a break. We'll be right back with more. with my friend Jeff Verdorn. We're talking about our series called New Friend. Same seven questions. Jeff's been a friend for a long time, but these seven questions are ones that you're going to hear 
often when you have discussions with people about faith. And one of the big questions uh, we're talking about now is the point a person becomes born again and is saved and how that happens. And I go back to the Philippian jailer talking to Paul, what must I do to be saved? It pretty much um, answers this whole salvation question very simply and straightforwardly because the jailer asked this very question to Paul. What must I do to be saved? And the simple answer from Paul is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, just as we were talking about earlier. So so look, there's, there's many different pictures of salvation in Scripture. You know, you got uh, Jesus says, just as Moses was lifted up the serpent in the desert, so whoever uh, looks at the, believes in the Son of Man will be saved. Well, you needed to look at the serpent to live, so you need to believe in Christ in order to be saved. The woman at the well. If you knew who you were speaking to, you would ask me and it would well up uh, to eternal life. This w- living For living water, and it would well up to eternal life. John chapter 4. Uh, the picture was clear. If you, if you would have asked Jesus for salvation, he would save you. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. I stand at the door and knock. Whosoever opens that door, a picture of faith, I will come in and eat with them. That's a picture of faith salvation. And, and and probably the greatest picture of all is the thief on the cross. I mean, at Jesus's resurrection, this second thief um, says basically one, one word, remember me, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that represented saving faith. The thief on the cross entrusted in Jesus for his eternal salvation, even though they were both about to die. The thief didn't belong to a church. He didn't give to the poor. He probably wasn't a very good guy. He was probably never baptized. He he probably didn't understand a lot of theology. And yet he did one thing. He believed. Mm. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Shall we move on? Yes. Question four. Yes. What does someone have to do to be saved? I know we talked about believing. Um, So maybe we should just say, what is the fate of the saved? So the fate of the saved, so we talked about the fate of the lost, and when we talked about that, we briefly talked about the fate of the saved, but the fate of the saved is, is, is eternal life. You know, Psalm 23, this famous Psalm of David, in verse 6, it says, surely goodness and love will follow me all of my days, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow. Hmm. That was a promise that he understood from God, that he would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life. In fact, our inheritance of this kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven, is this eternal life. God often speaks of this inheritance that we have. Now that we're children of God, we're heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ, into an inheritance that God says can never spoil or fade or perish. First Peter 3 says it this way, on the fate of believers. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth, being born again, and into a living hope, through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So as believers in Christ, God says we have an inheritance, and that inheritance is kept in heaven for us. It's shielded by His power, So we know that once we're saved, God has promised us a future, a future inheritance, and it will come true. Bill, I've read the back of the book. Mm. We win. I love it. I love it. So the other thing God promises to believers is our glorification. 
Um, we, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, God says. So God says that every single believer will receive a new glorified bodies. Romans 8 says we'll be conformed to the image of his son. Philippians 3 says that we, he will transform our lowly body so that they will be like his body. We shall be like him, and yet this glorification is yet future. We don't, we're still in our, what Paul and Peter actually call our earth tent, this tent of our body. We are dwelling in our earthly tent, a temporary dwelling. We have a permanent, a glorified body in which we will live forever and ever. Let me read 1 Corinthians 15. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. That's this earthly body. It's going to waste away. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. As was the earthly man, that's Adam, by the way, so are those who are of the earth. Unbelievers in our natural state are like Adam. And as it is the man from heaven, who is Jesus, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the man from earth, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Well, the man of heaven has been glorified. He rose from the grave in glory and power. His glorified body is what is in store for us. We will also receive our glorified bodies. Verse 50, I declare you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We must receive a new glorified, eternal, imperishable new body. And that happens, by the way, on Resurrection Day. Uh, I think Scripture points to that day as being the rapture of the church, when the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive will be changed and into glory and then caught up together with them in the clouds. That is the rapture. And then, of course, the end fate is in the back of the book, Revelation chapter 21, John sees the vision of a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem coming mm-hmm. down from heaven. This is where we have the streets of gold and the pearly gates and the whole bit. We only have one chapter describing this, but that is the believer's ultimate uh, eternal destiny. This new, He makes all things new. Um, this current earth is burned up. Heaven, and he makes everything new again. Heaven and earth, which are apart today, come together for all of eternity. And he says this, he says, nothing unrighteous will ever enter into it. So (laughs) God, God had to take and take the unrighteous lost and, and exclude them from this new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem by throwing them into the lake of fire. So he dealt with the unrighteousness. We then as the righteous will enter into this eternal state forever and ever and ever, and nothing unrighteous will ever enter into it. Mm, such thrilling words, Jeff. You know, there's some, I, I've heard people say, I know this is almost like a cartoon, but I, I don't want to end up playing harp on a cloud. Hmm, well, we need some drums and some guitars <laughs> and some... <laughs> Just to round out the band? Yeah, we got yeah. we to... You know, I think we will... People don't picture eternity. Many people will picture it as kind of this, uh, you know, surreal spiritual existence where we're floating around with clouds and whatever. No, it's we our new bodies, our new glorified bodies. Look, Jesus in his glorified body was touched. He was hugged. He ate. He yep. walked with people. We will be able to do the same thing. I think we'll be able to play instruments. In fact, I think we'll be able to play instruments very well. We'll have thousands of years to practice, mm-hmm, right? Yeah. I and like we'll that. be able to get together and sing glory to God and, uh, and take walks and... Things that we could do here on earth, we'll be able to do on the new earth. Uh, we'll just do it in a much better, grander, more glorified way. Mm-hmm. Jeff Redorn is my guest. We're in a series of asking the same seven questions, which I have uh, I have a fondness for, because I think it's really good to be always reminding ourselves of what we believe and how we can express our faith to others. So... Let's move on, Jeff. Uh, so do you, do, do all 
who believe move from death to life. Yes. And what, well, but what if I mess up with a really bad sin? <laughs> yeah, so positionally, every person who believes has been moved from death to life. That's, 1 John 3 actually says that. We know that we have passed from death to life. 1 John 5 says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Remember, we talked about body, soul, and spirit a minute ago. When you believe, you literally move spiritually from death to life. Remember that phrase in in John chapter 3 when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, you must be born of water, your natural birth, but you also must be born of spirit, your spiritual birth. He described that as being, quote, born again. Spirit gives birth to spirit. There's your spiritual birth. When the moment you believe, you move from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. That's what being born again means. Every single Christian is born again. I remember my my mother told me this story. She was at a, a party, and she was talking to a lady wearing a cross, and she says, oh, you're wearing a cross. Are you a Christian? And she said, yes, I am, but not one of those born again types. And it's like, well, and I, and I asked my mom, and you replied with, and she said, oh, I didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, what do you, re- what do you reply with that? She said, how would you would have replied? And I said, I probably would have said something like, well, you know, there's no other kind of Christian. Every single Christian, by definition, is born again. You've moved from death to life. You are now a new creation. His spirit has given birth to your spirit, and you are now a new creation. That's what being born again is all about. So what about our what about now that now positionally that you've been united with God, you're one with him, you've been born again. What if you sin? Well, I've asked classes for 20 years if anybody is living out this, you know, call to live a holy life perfectly. Mm-hmm. As a believer in Christ, Any takers? N- not one hand has been raised yeah, in over 20 so. years. So we all have this common existence that even though God has made us holy and righteous and blameless in his eyes, we don't live out our calling perfectly every day, right? So we continue to sin. But this is where this great promise of God is. The moment you're saved, you stand forgiven before God. Past, present, and and future sins have been forgiven. God says of the believer that he no longer counts your sins against you. He says, He says, as far as the east is from the west, he's going to remove our sins from us. Now, you know how far east is from west? Well, it's infinitely far. He says in Isaiah 43 that he'll remember them no more. Wow. Wow, an omniscient God says he remembers them no more. I think that's really, he, he was no longer going to count our sins against us because the penalty for our sins was paid on the cross, and we received Christ as our Savior and received this salvation, this forgiveness from him. So our assurance of salvation, even though we fall short every day, as I read from Peter earlier, our salvation is kept in heaven for us, shielded by his power. Having believed, you were marked in him with a spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So even when we sin, we know that God now sees us as a saint, as holy and blameless in his eyes because it has nothing to do with my righteousness and everything to do with Christ's righteousness that he has imputed on me. Hmm. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, we've got a couple more questions uh, on my list of seven. Jeff Ferdorn is my guest. If you don't already recognize his voice, We are going to be right back in just a minute. Receive a daily email featuring a scripture graphic. Sign up for this first of the day email at myfaithradio.com. Welcome back to the show, Brent. Same seven questions, and I think they're great questions. Helps us understand our faith, and when people ask us questions, we're going to be equipped to answer them. So 
We're all the way down to question six, and here it is, Jeff. Has God given me all I need for life and godliness as a believer? So this is kind of the question, all the other questions are, you know, how do I enter into um, a relationship with God? What happens if I don't end in, enter in a relationship with God? What happens if I do? This question is, okay, so now that I've entered into this relationship, what do I have right now in this life as a believer in Christ? So the simple answer, has God given us everything that we need for godliness as a believer? And the answer is yes, he has. In fact, Second Peter chapter uh, 1 says his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. So I, I, I take that as a yes. He has given us everything we need to live out this Christian walk. Ephesians 1 says that he's blessed us in, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. This idea, we have right now as a believer, the God of the universe dwelling within us. Colossians 1 says that Christ is in us and he is our hope of glory. In, in Latin, uh, the, the old theologians called this the unio mystica, the mystical union. How can the God of all creation dwell within a believer? Well, it's, a, it's actually a great mystery. Paul says in Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 5, he says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. But this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So when we believe, somehow spiritually, God takes up residence within the believer. And so we have been united. And that's that's exactly what Jesus prayed in what's called his high priestly prayer, by the way, in John 17, where he says, I pray that they will be one in us just as we are one. May we be one as we as may they be one as we are one and I in them and you in me. So just as Christ and God and the Spirit are one, now two us as believers have been invited into this union of God, the God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And we are now united with him. So yes, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Uh, Philippians says that he supplies all of our needs. He he says it says that the scripture says he makes grace abound in us more and more. He strengthens us by the power of his spirit. Ephesians three, and and in Jude, there's this great kind of uh, end to Jude where it says, "Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy." To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. So yeah, it sure sounds like he's the one who makes us stand. He will bring us to the finish line. He's got us in his hands and nothing can take us out of, out of his hands. He will never leave us, never forsake us. So yes, the promises uh, of God's word that we have God within us and he's given us everything. Uh, that we need uh, is 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 all over Scripture. Mm-hmm. What if I feel like my prayers maybe aren't getting answered, and I'm thinking, well, what else do I need to do to get better results? You know, this is uh, how does prayer work? Do we move the hand of God when we pray, or was God going to move? And when we are prompted to pray, we then see God working in our lives. Well, this is way above my pay grade, but when we pray. We can get a yes, and we see prayers answered. Sometimes we get a wait, and we have to be patient on the Lord. And sometimes it's a no. I think the key to prayer is to, when we ask according to his will, Scripture says. So if if something is consistent with the will of God, then the answer will be yes. And uh, we can trust God for it. So look, pray about everything. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 and 7, great passage, says basically this, don't worry, pray about everything and be happy. It says, it says, don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, bring your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It's that peace of God 
Sounds really nice, doesn't it? It does. Sometimes, though, you bring your prayers to God with anxiety and anxiousness. And it, Paul says, come with a spirit of gratitude. Yeah, I think thankfulness is one of these keys to this faith walk. Uh, thankfulness and, and its its twin cousin, uh, contentment. Mm-hmm. Paul says he learned the secret of being content in any and all situations. So I think this idea, if we can really come before God and say, you know what, Lord, I am thankful for this day, no matter what my circumstances are, I've learned the secret of being content no matter what situations I find myself in. I think that's one of the keys of living out this faith journey. Yeah. All right, Jeff, we're getting down to the wire here. So let's look at question number seven out of seven. You've done an awesome job. Thank you for all the work you've done Mm -hmm. and giving us such solid answers. I can't wait to listen to this a second time. Number seven is, as we submit to him, and this is a biggie because we have to figure out, are we submitting to God? Are we dying to ourself? Galatians 2.20 I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Are we at that point where we submit to him, we die to ourself? If I do that, will I have an abundant life? Hmm. I don't want to have a bad life. I want to be happy. You know, these last two questions are uh, actually say a lot in, in that, has God blessed us with everything that we need? The answer is yes, but then why aren't we living this victorious Christian life? And I think this next question uh, answers that. And that is, it's not because God hasn't given us something. He's given us him very, his very self, and, and he's dwelling within us. So why aren't we experiencing this abundant life? And I think when you quote John, uh, Galatians 2.20, that's exactly the reasons why, is we don't understand that our old self has been crucified with Christ, we've been raised with Christ in the heavenly realms, and we have a new life. It's like I've heard pastors try to explain this exchange life, that the old self is gone and God has raised this new self. And they use the metaphor of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, this metamorphosis that happens when a caterpillar, which is a lowly caterpillar crawling around on the ground and on branches and eating leaves, right, Mm -hmm. goes through this transformation and becomes a butterfly and now is flying above it all. In the same way, when we are lost and dead in our sins and we are saved, we become a new creation, a butterfly. But instead of flying around in victory, because we are now a butterfly, we continue to crawl around on the dirt, wallowing in the mud which we left. So God says, don't live any longer in this way that you used to live, but live a holy, a consecrated, separated life for me. Don't you know that you've died to sin? How can you live in it any longer? Don't you know that you've been raised with Christ? Live in that victory. That is is the key, I think, to the abundant life. When we abide in Christ, John 15, he says he is the one that produces the fruit. We can't produce the fruit. We're just a branch. But as we abide in the vine, his fruit, by the way, what's his fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Boy, if I possess those qualities in increasing measure, that sounds like an abundant life to me. So how do we get to that abundant life in Christ? We abide in him. We trust him with all of our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. We seek first his kingdom. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We set our mind on things above, not on earthly things. We store up our treasures in heaven, not on earth where moth and rust destroy. We believe in Christ not only for our salvation by faith, we also walk by faith, trusting in him every step of the way. And then God's peace, you know, we just talked about a couple minutes ago, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. That sounds like an abundant life to me. Sure does. Jeff, thank you so much. I 
really enjoy this series, and I so enjoyed your responses to all of those seven questions. If you missed any of this, I encourage you to go to MyFaithRadio.com. Check it out. Have a great night, and God bless. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.